John and Annie Glenn had a love story for the ages. This is John Glenn, the war hero who flew 59 missions in World War II and flew 90 missions in the Korean War. This is John Glenn, the pilot, who was the first to average supersonic speed on a transatlantic flight. This is John Glenn, the astronaut, the space hero, who was the first American to orbit the Earth. This is John Glenn, the leader, a United States Senator from 1974 to 1999. Now those are remarkable achievements, but they don't touch the love story that John shared with his wife, Annie. Uh, the two actually knew each other as far back as the playpen. You see, John's parents and Annie's parents were friends in New Concord, Ohio. And when they got together for fellowship and for an evening, it, John and Annie were there, even as very young children. And so they grew up together. Now, we know about John Glenn's achievements, but as far as Annie's concerned, man, she was bright, caring, and talented with a wonderful spirit. But Annie had one challenge that haunted her. She stuttered. In fact, she was labeled and described in her stuttering as an 85% disability. What that meant is that 85% of the time, she struggled to get words out in a way to communicate with other people. Annie dreaded, as a student, standing before a class to recite a poem. As an adult, she was embarrassed to ask a sales clerk for help. And in restaurants, she would just point to items on a menu. But John loved Annie. In fact, what he would say is that if people couldn't look beyond that stuttering, then they really missed a great opportunity to meet a wonderful human being. What a great compliment. John and Annie Glenn were married for 73 years. That is a love story for the ages. By the way, when Annie was in her 50s, she was able to participate in some therapy which helped to clear up her voice and her words. She didn't stutter. And when John heard that for the first time to hear Annie speak to him, uh, the story is told that he just fell to his knees in prayer of gratitude to God for providing that gift and that breakthrough for Annie. Now, for all of his achievements... There was one thing that John Glenn was not good at. He was not good at saying goodbyes. And so any time that he was about to be separated from Andy, that they had worked out this little code, uh, a phrase that they would say to each other, John would tell Andy, I'm just going down to the corner to get a pack of gum. I'm going down to the corner to get a pack of gum. Now, she would respond with a simple phrase, don't be long. What a beautiful code with each other. Uh, now, this is interesting. In 1988, when John Glenn was 77, he went on a mission on the space shuttle Discovery. And as he prepared for that mission, they again were about to be separated. And he told Annie the same thing. He said, I'm just going down to the corner to get a pack of gum. And then he gave Annie a pack of gum. As the story is told, she put that pack of gum in a pocket that stayed close to her heart until she was reunited with her husband. She wanted him to be safely home. Goodbyes are difficult. I think of my own home as I was growing up from the, the time that I first left for college, I will remember as I would back out of our driveway that, that my dad would be on one end of that and he would just be looking and tears would begin to come down his eyes. Now, now you see, Daddy had said goodbye. He said, I love you. He, he had given me a hug. 
he left nothing unsaid. But daddy wasn't good at goodbyes. Because he loved his family. In fact, on September 8th, 2011, it's Abby's birthday. And the phone rang. I looked at the caller ID and it was my mom and dad. And I knew that daddy would be the one making the call. But I also knew that he was calling to talk to Abby. And so I handed her the phone. She answered it and was able to talk to Papa and talk to Nanny. I wish I had known. I wish I had known that that would be the last time that we would ever have opportunity to talk to my dad. Because literally only a few hours later, my father succumbed to one final heart attack. I don't feel like I had that opportunity to say goodbye. And so there are many times now that I want to pick up the phone and call him and just tell him something that I think that he would enjoy hearing or ask him for advice. Man, I'd love just even to sit down with him and share a final meal, to share one more cup of coffee. Goodbyes are difficult. You know, I have heard it said over the years, this different statements that people have made to me, that death is just a natural part of living. Uh, Death is just part of the life cycle. And those phrases have always bothered me. And I figured out why. It's because death is not a natural part of living. And death is not part of the normal life cycle. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 12 with me if you would. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Why did death come into the world? Death came into the world as part of sin, as part of the fall of man. And so it was not originally intended to be part of the natural life cycle. It was a consequence of sin entering the world. Let's open up our Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis. We want to continue our study into the life of Joseph. Now, this morning, I want us to be reminded of the fact that that Jacob, Joseph's father, and Joseph, they, they lived under this shadow of goodbye for 22 years. You remember that Joseph was his father's favorite. But we remember this in chapter 37 of Genesis. Joseph's brothers, they acted out of their anger, their hatred, their jealousy of Joseph. And they sold him as a slave for 20 shekels of silver. A group of Ishmaelites came along. They had already had Joseph prepared. They had attacked him and thrown him into a cistern. He was ready to go. And so when the money exchanged hands, they handed Joseph off to a group of Ishmaelites. And as they left on their way to Egypt, The brothers just continued to laugh and have a good time. That was 22 years ago. Now, here's one of the things that I've wondered, is what would the brothers tell their father? I don't know that we really talked about that in that series, so we need to talk about that today. Here's what they told their father in chapter 37, beginning of verse 31. Then they got Joseph's robe. Remember that that colorful robe? They slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. And so his father wept for him. Joseph was gone, and Jacob was 
devastated because he had been led to believe that his son had died. You have to fast forward now for 22 years. And what we have been looking at in these past few weeks are these journeys to Egypt. Uh, There was a famine in the land. Remember, seven good years of plenty and then seven years of famine. We're two years into that famine, and, and it was a bad deal. That famine had reached over a large, a great area, including the land of Canaan. And so Jacob heard that there was grain available in Egypt, and so he sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain. And in chapter 42, verse 13, Joseph's brothers actually approached Joseph. Now, they didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. The key I want us to notice today is what they told Joseph about their family. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Benjamin had stayed home with Jacob. But Joseph was no more. It it seems like had the brothers told this story enough that they had really come to believe it themselves? That Joseph was no more? He was out of sight, out of mind, so he, he must be no more. That's what they told Joseph. Now, when they went back home and they reported to their father of how the trip had gone, look what they had to say. In chapter 42, verses 30 through 32. The man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We were twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Boy, this was their story, and they were sticking to it. It's what they had told their father in chapter 37. It's what they had told Joseph in chapter 42. And as they went back to talk to their father, that's what they continued to tell them. By the way, do you remember in that first trip, the first journey to Egypt, Joseph kept Simeon, as a slave, and he was going to remain in prison until the brothers came back with Benjamin, that youngest son who had remained at home. And so now Simeon is in Egypt as the brothers came back. Look at Jacob's response to that news. Chapter 42, verse 36. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. And Jacob's heart just continued to ache. Joseph was gone, no more. And and Jacob has this mentality because Simeon has remained in Egypt and the circumstances of that. He has already declared that Simeon is no more. And now he has found out that the next time that they go, Benjamin has to go as well? Jacob's not real sure about that. On that second journey, we remember this, that as Joseph uh, was so filled with emotion, remember this was a time when Benjamin was there, and he looked and he saw Benjamin, and he just was unable to control himself. And so he removed himself, gained that composure, and then he came back to them. And he just felt, he just declared, and he announced who he was. He did have a question, and he also had a plan. Let's look at that. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were unable to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Going down to verse 4, that's when Joseph said, Come closer to me. This is really me. I want you to get close so that you can see. It's really me. I'm Joseph. Look at verse 5. Joseph said, And now do not be distressed 
and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph had an announcement. I am Joseph. Come near to me. He had a question. And then he had a plan. Chapter 45, verse 9, that plan. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live with me in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. I want us to to start at the bottom, work our way back up. Look at what Joseph had to tell his brothers. First of all, remember we're starting at the end. So he told them, he said, I want you to go, bring everybody back. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. And there are five tough years of famine left, but I will provide for you. Before that, he told them, he said, I I don't want you to feel bad. Don't be angry with yourselves because God had a plan for this. God had a plan for me to be able to save you and to save your families. That's why I was sent here. And Joseph was able to understand that, so he's communicating that to his brothers. He had told them before that, he said, come closer. I want you to see me. I want you to see that I am Joseph. Now, all of these statements are important. I'm going to take care of you and your family. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to feel guilty. Don't worry about that. I want you to make sure that you understand. I am Joseph. All of those are important. But that's not the first thing Joseph said. Joseph announced to them, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? That was the first question on Joseph's mind. That was the question to which he wanted an answer. And so that's what he asked his brothers. Look at what transpires as the brothers go back to Canaan. Chapter 45, verse 25. And so they went up out of Egypt and they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. I I, I hope that you will remember that beautiful statement from this passage. The spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Man, isn't that beautiful? At first, you know, man, he was having a hard time understanding or believing this, but then he saw the evidence before him, saw perhaps the change in the countenance of his son's faces, and then he saw evidence with the the things that had been provided to be able to get him to Egypt. And his spirit was revived. All right, so they make their way toward Egypt. I want us to now to look at Joseph because Joseph is going to go out to meet his family. Chapter 46, verse 29. Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Man, we could not, we could not talk about these two journeys today and, and leave out 
this wonderful news, the reunion that took place for 22 years. The shadow of death had hovered over Jacob and Joseph. Joseph was convinced that his son, I'm sorry, Jacob was convinced his son had died, and Joseph was unsure whether his father was still living. And so here they were. They were able to be reunited. Jacob's spirit is revived. And then you can tell that Joseph, man, there was no such thing as royal protocol. When he saw his father, he got down off that chariot, he ran to meet his father, and he wrapped his arms around him, and he hugged him. Because the reunion was just that great. That's how wonderful it was for them to be back together again. Goodbyes. It's a word that many of us know far too well. Our times of sorrow come with this huge spectrum of emotion. Uh, whether it is sadness, anger, loneliness, or I'll, uh, this word is, is really descriptive. Strength, draining, grief. Strength, draining, grief. It just, it just drains the life out of us. Because our heartache is so great. And that's the, the pain of having to say goodbye here on earth. Uh, but I know this, you know, separation exhausts our spirit, but understand this today. This is our good news today. We live with a spirit of hope. Because God has declared, He has served notice that death is an unwelcome visitor. God has declared that. Death is an unwelcome visitor. And death came into our world because of sin. But if we look, I want to give you a specific passage. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews 9, verse 28. What I want us to see is that Jesus came and died on the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sin. But then, Jesus will appear again. Uh, let's just look at the passage. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. There's something I need us to talk about. In Genesis chapter 46, there is a long list of the family. It's all of the family that came from Canaan to Egypt. We haven't studied that, but that list is important because it gives us this, this full genealogy of who was there, this descriptive list, so that we can know who made that journey. There is a list that we need to be aware of. And it's a list that is described, it's described in the book of Psalms, it's described in uh, Philippians, it's described in Revelation. The book of life. And we want to make sure that our names are recorded in the book of life. Well, what, what's the significance of that, Johnny? What's the significance of being in the book of life? Well, remember when we talk about in Hebrews 9, uh, that Jesus will appear a second time to bring those who are eagerly waiting? Well, Jesus is looking for those whose names are listed in the book of life. And so the question belongs to us is, do we long for this day where there will be no more goodbyes? And the answer to that is yes. And in heaven, there will be no more goodbyes. What we will experience as we leave this earth, this earth where we have sin and that death is entered because of sin and we know the, the struggles that come with that, but in heaven, 
There will be no more goodbyes. And, and I think about how Jacob's spirit was revived and how for us, that man, we look at what this promise holds for us. And what we need to understand today is that this hope ought to excite us. This is news that is good news that should excite us. That through Jesus Christ, through His life, through His death, the sacrifice, and the fact that Jesus has been risen from the dead and He has ascended to heaven where He sits at the right hand of the throne of God. But He will appear a second time to call the faithful home whose names are in the book of life. And now that news, that should help us, friends, from having a sagging heart to having a seeking heart. That should help us from the times that we want to be mournful to realize the hope that we have. And we go from mournful to hopeful. We will go from the land of goodbye to the land of endless day. That is the beauty that is described for us in heaven. Jacob and Joseph had to meet again on that road between Canaan and Goshen. We will have an opportunity to meet together with all the faithful who have gone before us when heaven is our home. And oh, what a great day that will be. Homecoming day. It's on God's calendar. Only God knows the day. And, and really, friends, He's the only one who needs to know. But it's on His calendar. And, and we know that. That's a great message of encouragement to us. And so our challenge in just the same way that Jacob's spirit was revived and he picks up his staff and he makes his way to Egypt to meet again with his son, is that we need to faithfully get up and, if you will, take our staff and begin that journey to walk toward the Lord where we follow Him. So the question becomes for us, is, are you prepared for that? Are we living a life that is, is mournful where we are remaining caught up in sin? Have you given your life to Jesus, the one who sacrificed his life for us, the one who will appear again to take us home to heaven? Have you given your life to Jesus, believing in him, confessing him as Lord, repenting of your sin? and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you begun that journey toward our heavenly home? If you haven't, I hope that you are studying that, and if you get to a point that, man, you have questions about it, or you're ready to make that decision, reach out to us. Give us a call. However it is that you want to get in touch with us, we would love to assist you in coming to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you have made that decision in the past. But you know what? Life can be tough. And there are things that can just happen in life that it's like it just, it just sucks the life out of us and we find ourselves at this point where our strength has been drained. Man, may our hope be renewed in Jesus Christ today. May our hope be renewed from this story in Scripture that reminds us of what can happen in our lives as we eagerly await that home in heaven, that reunion that will take place. It will be homecoming day.